It's a blessing to be in God's house, to be joining God's people worldwide in prayer and song and listening to God's word, both read and preached. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Beginning our worship this morning with hymn number two. Stand and look, take a hymnal number two. Come thou almighty king. Stand and sing it to God. Great morning to each of you and welcome to worship. To our online community and to our television viewers, we're excited that you are here as well. My friends, you could have gone to any other church, <clears throat> but you were directed here and I want you to know that we are glad about it. And so my friends, if you happen to be a first time visitor, don't worry, I'm not about to ask you to stand up and give us a testimony. But in fact, I am going to ask if you would look in the pew back right there. You're going to see a vibrant, colorful card that says, hello, we're glad that you're here. If you would consider please filling out that card, giving us just a bit of your personal information. Again, we're not going to call you like a bill collector, but we are wanting to know a bit more about you simply because that's our way of knowing about you to ultimately hope that we can connect you to our community. We're glad you're here. We're excited that you're here. And again, welcome to worship. And so with all of that being said, can we pray together? God, you're good. You're awesome in all your ways. And we've assembled in this house to give you praise, to give you honor and to give you glory. And so God, please free us from every distraction, free us from every hindrance and let us worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. My friends, I wanna remind you that the entire month of January, we are collecting winter accessories. If you're like me, you may say, what in the world or do you mean, Joshua? Well, we're, we're collecting coats, blankets, earmuffs, ear warmers, you name it. Anything that can be used to keep someone warm, we want those things. We have some bins located in the front of our church and if by chance God moves in your heart and stirs your heart a bit, I'm gonna ask if you would to please consider buying some new or gently used items and placing it in those baskets. 
Also, our women are gearing up for the Be Still Women's Retreat. I'm upset because they tell me I cannot go with them. But I want you to know they're going to have an exciting time. It's going to be from February 21st through the 23rd. They're going to the Pinnacle Retreat Center in Clayton, Georgia. Now, I'm sure you're saying, well, I can read, Joshua. I know you can. But one thing that most of us often overlook is the deadline for payment. And so, my friends, the deadline for payment happens to be on February 1st. And Heather told me to mention this to you, so I am. And so, please, <laughs> think about submitting payment by February 1st. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> and so, my friends, um, at this time, listen to a call from wisdom from the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. Wisdom cries out in the street, in the squares she raises her voice. At the busiest corner she cries out, at the entrance of the city gates she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices, for waywardness kills the simple and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread or disaster.
We continue in our reading of scripture, looking at a passage from the book of Acts, page 897 in your pew Bible. Listen to the word of God. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and with a gesture began to speak. You Israelites and others who fear God, listen. The God of this people chose Israel as our ancestors and made them great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. For about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. After he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance for about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until the time of the prophet Samuel. Then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin who reigned for 40 years. When he had removed him, he made David their king. In his testimony about him, he said, I have found David, son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart who will carry out all of my wishes. Of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had already proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his work, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but one is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of the sandals on his feet. Here ends the scripture reading. Father, sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Lord, you know each one of us so intimately. Lord, as we sit here in this place today and we bring our best gifts to worship you, Lord, we know that you know all about us. You search us, you know us. And Lord, you love us. You love who we are, the authentic us. You love us, and we thank you for that. Lord, we acknowledge that in today's world, sometimes there's pressures and things that call our attention to try to fit in with the crowd and to go the way that everyone else does and to do things the way everyone else does. But Lord, you call us to something a bit different, to follow in the way of Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to learn from him, to grow close to him, to be like him in a world that needs love. Lord, on this weekend, I'm reminded of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I remember the way that he taught and showed the world what it means to love and to work for justice and equality. Lord, raise up in us a prophetic voice so that we might speak your truth and your goodness to the world in our relationships, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Lord, may we bear witness to the goodness of you. Lord, I pray for all those today who don't have the things that they need, who are struggling with financial concerns, who may be sick and waiting for healing or in a time of doubt and questioning. Lord, be present with them. Be their comforter. 
be their Prince of Peace. Lord, we pray today especially for those who don't know you. Lord, draw them to you. Draw them in with your great love as your people share it in the world. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Continuing our worship, we turn to hymn number 12, standing as we sing, God, our Father, we adore thee. Number 12, standing as we sing. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, we lift up to thee all who are hurting in any way. Bring to them the peace and of body and spirit. We thank you for your many blessings to us. And now return to you these offerings so that the message of salvation may be spread over all the earth. We pray in the name of and with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Be seated, please. And take your hymnal as we continue to worship in song with number 68, remaining seated as we sing, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. Each year across the months of January and February, I have taken one book of the Bible to preach through across two months. That way we get some appreciation for the, the storyline, the narrative arc, and we don't just grab a, a text out of its uh, literary home, but hear it in the larger story. Today we're in week three of 1 Samuel. Next week, you might have noticed, is Youth Sunday, and Joshua Scott will be preaching, but we looked at it, and the theme in 1 Samuel next week is on disobedience. Josh said, I think I can handle it. I think I can, I think I can keep that theme going, and we'll just stay in 1 Samuel uh, next week as well. Today, I'm reading from chapter 8, the first 22 verses. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. 
For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from that day, I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing to you. Now listen, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words that the Lord had said to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen, to run his chariots. He'll appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and set a king over them. Samuel then said to the people of Israel, Each of you return home. Those of you who were here last week will remember that when the voice of God called to Samuel, ordaining him to his divine purpose as a judge over Israel, Samuel was asleep next to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was Israel's highest treasure. It was reported to have contained Aaron's staff and the stone tablets of Moses, but mostly it was a symbol of the very presence of God with the people of Israel. The ark's home was in the temple, but if the Israelites were on the move, like during the years of Exodus, they carried this treasure with them. Imagine if we had something equivalent in our country, one box in this country that housed the original biblical writings, George Washington's wooden teeth, the original Declaration of Independence, Lincoln's stovetop hat. The ark was a national treasure, but more, it was the holiest thing in all of Israel. It was for them the very presence of God. One day in battle, after 4,000 men had lost their lives to the neighboring Philistines, someone thought it would be a good idea to go get the ark of the covenant, bring it out to the battlefield. God's presence with us on the battlefield. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? Well, it turns out it was not a good idea. It did disrupt and disturb the Philistines when they heard all the roar and excitement. But still, the Philistines dis- defeated Israel, this time killing 30,000 men, and they stole the ark. They stole the ark as a spoil of war. Can you imagine the grief of the Israelites after the loss of this, their most sacred treasure? But then, after some months, the Philistines kept looking over at the ark. They started feeling a little queasy about it. 
is it the God of Israel, the, the God who brought those famines and plagues? And I'm just not feeling too good about having this thing around. So after seven months, they decided that they would return the ark along with a few uh, guilt gifts. They no longer wanted to be curators of the lost ark. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, that's beneath me. All right, Eli's died. Samuel's been the judge of Israel for some time. He's no spring chicken either. In his role as judge, Samuel makes decisions about justice among the independent tribes, but the tribes of Israel are not ruled by Samuel. They, they were ruled by God. They listened to God's voice, God's direction for their lives. They understood that their one loyalty was to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is, until they got scared. This, this thing with the 30,000 men dying in battle and the ark being captured make, made them wonder if it wasn't time for a change. So the tribal elders went and met with Samuel at his home in Ramah. They apparently did not appoint their most diplomatic spokesperson because he said, number one, Samuel, you are old. Number two, your sons are just as sorry as Eli's sons were. We want a king. This is the way it is in the text. You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. We want to be like everybody else, even if it's not good. But mom, it's not fair if the other kids get to stay out past 11 and I don't. All of my friends are going to Panama City Beach for spring break with no parents going. Dad, all the cool kids are wearing a mullet. <laughs> I mean, no matter how bad the decision, we all live with a silent pressure to be like everybody else. I was once on Jekyll Island at a convenience store. I saw five or six teenage guys coming out of this convenience store, holding or drinking a carton of chocolate milk. And I thought, there is no way six guys walked into a convenience store and said, you know, I've got a hankering for some chocolate milk. There's no way. But somewhere in there, somewhere, well, I'm not going to be the only one. Not if everybody else is doing it. And in our fast and competitive lives, we're dealing with the constant onslaught of what I ought to be doing to live up to expectations. Everybody else seems to be thriving. What is everybody else doing? Everybody else seems to have well-behaved children and fresh vegetables. I just don't measure up. I want to do what everybody else is doing. I love this quote. This is a Facebook post from 2017. How to be a mom in 2017, she wrote. Make sure your children's academic, emotional, psychological, mental, spiritual, physical, and social needs are met while being careful not to overstimulate, understimulate, improperly medicate, helicopter, or neglect them in a screen-free, processed foods-free, GMO-free, negative energy-free, plastic-free, body-positive, socially conscious, egalitarian, but also authoritative, nurturing but fostering of independence, gentle but not overly permissive, pesticide-free, two-story, multilingual home, preferably in a cul-de-sac, with a backyard yard and 1.5 siblings, spaced at least two years apart for proper development. And also don't forget the coconut oil. <laughs> then she added this, how to be a mom in literally every generation before ours. Feed them sometimes. <laughs> the pressure to be like others. 
All of the other countries have a king. We want a king too. God doesn't approve, but God permits. It's a part of what it means to be made with free will. God lets us make bad choices. Love is never coercive. We must be free to say yes to love, which means that we must be free to make bad choices. And living under God's sovereignty, God's rule, did not require a hierarchy in the human community. But all the neighboring countries had kings. That's what they're doing at the cool table. Samuel warns the tribal leaders, you don't want a king, you really don't. Israel emerged as an alternative to human kingship. You have such a short memory. Do you remember Pharaoh? This is why we left, to stake out a way of living under the kingship of God. A king will end up taking your sons for his army, taking your daughters to cook in his palace, taking the best of your vineyards and orphans, orchards. He'll take the best of your cattle and leave you with the runts. He'll take a tithe. He'll take one-tenth of what you have. The king will take for himself what you know is due to God. And one day, one day you're going to regret it and cry. Samuel makes this most impassioned appeal. And the judges answer him in verses 19 and 20. No. But we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may go before us and fight our battles. And God tells Samuel, if that's what they want. I don't approve, but they're free to make bad choices if they want to. Obviously, as this story shows, the pressure to be like everybody else is not just the domain of peer pressure. This pressure is as ancient as Israel and as current as this morning's AJC. This week we learned about baseball managers getting fined and fired because they were cheating. But everybody's probably doing it right. I mean, everybody's just trying to find a little edge, right? This week we've listened to national politicians be mean to political appoint, uh, opponents. Not, not just differ on policy or differentiate their position. Call each other nasty names. But that's just the nature of politics, right? Everybody's doing it. This week in the impeachment back and forth, one of the questions that gets asked a lot, will anybody break ranks with their party and vote the other way, or, would they, or will they yield to the pressure to vote like everybody else on their side of the aisle? It's hard to stand alone. Nobody wants to be the odd one out. All of the other nations have a king, and we want one too. But just pointing to other people doing it is, is sport. The more serious consideration is looking hard at the ways we might be doing the same thing. The Israelites were the called out ones, the chosen people. They were to get their direction from God. It was a theocracy, God as their ruler. But they wanted to follow the example of the surrounding culture and God allows it, even though it's not what God wants. Well, how are we doing? We're the church of Jesus Christ called out to be different, not to adopt the politics and values and priorities of the culture around us, but to listen for and follow the voice of God. How are you doing at standing alone for what is right, even if it's not popular? I remember the story of a monk named Telemachus. He, he, he lived in a simple monastery out from Rome. But he took a trip into, into, ancient, uh, in, into ancient Rome in the year 402 A.D. And when he got there, 
he was all caught up in this crowd of people. There was all this big excitement going on in town. This young man who had grown up so far from the city, he kind of got swept away in it all. He wasn't sure why the crowd was there, wasn't sure where the crowd was going, but he got swept away in that crowd, and he ends up in the Roman Colosseum. He doesn't know what's going on still. He starts asking questions of those around him, and he found out that the Romans had just defeated the Goths, and it was time for a celebration. Well, about that time, the big muscular gladiators come out. They come out into the arena, bowing before the emperor, lifting high their swords, and soon the bloody brawl began. And this is going on just a few hundred yards in front of him, and it was a fight to the death, and it made Telemachus sick. Not only the violence of the gladiators, but also this, this bloodthirsty frenzy that was in the crowd. Now, now keep in mind, this was after Constantine. This is after Rome had become a Christian nation. Telemachus walked, watched in horror and disgust. And he faced a choice, one that we all face, be like everybody else or stand out, sit in silence or speak. Telemachus yelled from his seat, in the name of Jesus, stop. Over and over he kept yelling, in the name of Jesus, stop. But because everybody around was in such a game time frenzy, nobody heard him, nobody paid attention. So he jumped over the wall, went out into the battle arena, and kept yelling, in the name of Jesus, stop. In the name of Jesus, stop. Well, the audience thought he was part of the show. They start laughing, cheering. He's running around. No, 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 in the name of Jesus, stop. Well, the gladiators stopped what they were doing and chased him as he continued to scream out. Finally, they had him trapped. The gladiators collapsed on Telemachus as he continued to scream, in the name of Jesus, stop. And they turned their swords on him. And the celebration ended. Well, when the emperor left... He kept hearing ringing in his ears, in the name of Jesus, stop. And soon after, the gladiator games were ended forever. The gladiator games ended because one Christ follower refused to give in to the pressure to be like everybody else. They seem to be little things. People playing shell games with the expense account. Everybody does it. Someone got hold of last year's test and everybody's passing it around looking at the answers. Everybody's doing it. Not including the one who's different. Nobody includes her. Nobody does. Everybody ignores her. The joke is demeaning. You know the joke is demeaning. But everybody else is laughing. Perhaps this is the right weekend to remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who wrote, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. It's hard to stand alone to not be like everybody else. But God didn't call you to be like everybody else. God called you to be like Christ in all things at all times, even when it's hard. Let's stand and sing our faith together.
Bill and Mary Lynn Gabbard have been with us for several months now, but as soon as Bill got here to be Minister of Music, Mary Lynn was still in Annapolis selling a house and buying a house here and relocating and doing all of that. They have now gotten into their new home. They are now settled, and now they're ready to make it official. Bill coming by statement, Mary Lynn uh, by watch care, and they want to throw their lives in long term. They bought a house, I'm telling you. They're here. And if you're as excited as I am about officially inviting them to be a part of us, I need a really strong amen out of you. Amen. That would have been really awkward if it had gone the other way, right? <laughs> Yeah. Y'all know what a gift this couple has been to us already and what a gift they will be to us for a long, long time. So following the benediction, would you come wrap your arms around them before you get out of here and go home? Let's stand for the benediction. Mm. Go now in the courage to do what is right, even if it's unpopular. Go to follow Christ and Christ alone. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us again today. You honor us by allowing our broadcast into your life. As you can see behind me, I'm in our beautiful but now empty sanctuary. But on Sunday mornings when this room is alive, this is my favorite place and my favorite hour of the week. We sing and pray and hear scripture together. And we become formed into community by God's presence with us. I know that some of you are not physically able to join us on Sundays, and I'm delighted that this broadcast lets us come to you. But if you are able to be with us, 11 o'clock on Sunday may end up becoming your favorite hour of the week too. Home or here, I hope you will worship with us again soon.